Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're looking at how pollution on the west side of Maui, including sewage, agriculture, and sediment runoff is affecting the coral reef ecosystem. We're at the Kahekili Herbivore Fisheries Management Area. In 2009, Kahekili became a protected area for herbivorous algae-eating fishes in order to help increase the reef's ability to fight off excessive algal growth. We start off with Tova Calendar from the West Maui Ridge to Reef Initiative talking to Sea Grant staff about the efforts to better understand the scope of the problem and what the local community is doing to respond. My name is Tova Callender and I coordinate the West Maui Ridge to Reef Initiative. And what is the Ridge to Reef Initiative? The Ridge to Reef Initiative is a collaborative effort including federal, state, and local partners trying to find and address the sources of land-based pollution negatively impacting our coastal environment. What kind of a background do you have to have your position? My background is in environmental science and management. So I am necessarily a generalist who has worked on the business side as well as the you know, legal side, social side, and the science side. So I look to everyone else to inform the really deep knowledge in all the different subject matters and play air traffic control to bring those pieces together so that we can leverage what everyone is doing and get to solutions faster. So we are focused in these five watersheds, Wahikuli down to Honolua. There are very big problems down here. Um, a few years ago, at one bay in particular, there were 23 brown water events in a single year. Huge brown plumes coming out. Each of those gulches and streams, and you saw there were many on the map, have been modified by the human activity above, the, the farming practices that resulted in pushing a lot of that uh, fine silt and sediment material into the, into the banks. And so the bed and the banks of all of those gulches are lined to various degrees with readily mobilizable fine silt that makes its way to the coast. One of the exciting things that's been happening over time is, as I said, we're getting more information in. So we finally have uh, coastal water quality data for 18 months. This information has just come in. This is the first map hot off the press. We have some pretty serious nitrogen issues in a few sections of our coastline. We're looking at nitrogen isotope testing in the areas with the highest nitrogen levels at the coastline to see whether or not we can start figuring out the flavor of the nitrogen, which will lead us towards the, towards the source. And pretty much everywhere exceeds the turbidity standards set by the State Department of Health. We've also had uh, USGS partnered with DAR and others doing uh, fat bags, semi-permeable membrane devices that they float out in locations offshore here, leave for 30 days, and it works like any bioaccumulating organism would work, where it, it absorbs into the fat. And they're testing for different classes. So what they're coming up with are, and it, of course it varies by area. Here we have extra hits of things. You know, here it's caffeine, it's anti-seizure medication, flame retardants. Uh, perfume ingredients. There's all kinds of medications come up here because the wastewater treatment plant comes here. You, maybe you'll get to swim in it later. Atrazine, uh, simazine, um, you know, a lot of the ag chemicals also coming up uh, in the different locations. I keep an active website at westmauir2r.com. You can find me through there. You can find more information. My name is Darla and I am um, with the Division of Aquatic Resources. The Division of Aquatic Resources, our kuleana, is to manage the life in the water from the shoreline to three miles out. My team, what we get to do the fun, sciencey part of it. We're actually in the water most of the time, um, collecting data and looking at trends in fish populations and coral health over time. C coral Reef Assessment and Monitoring Program, CRAMP, it's those data that showed that we had lost close to 50% of our coral cover at this particular site over a period of 10 to 15 years, which is really fast. So that spurred looking into why is this happening? We were having a lot of invasive algal blooms at the time. There was science looking at how do you deal with that? These particular algal species, your Acanthophora specifera, uh, they were doing taste tests, if you will, over at HIMB and found that, well, fish love to eat it. This is a good thing. If fish love to eat it, if you protect the herbivores, 
then maybe we can get ahead of the curve here, right? The area itself, the management area, starts just south of Black Rock, where the Sheraton is, and continues up north to Honokawai Park. So it's about two miles. In the seven years that we've had it going now, we've seen incredible results, a lot sooner than we would have imagined. Um, we've seen a 130-odd, 38% increase in parrotfish biomass. We've seen a little over 40% increase in uh, surgeonfish biomass. So parrots, surgeons, and chubs were the protected species, or families here. We've seen um, size classes uh, grow. So your larger parrot fishes are more abundant now. Although the last two years, the data show there's been some poaching. But um, we've also seen uh, something really incredible, which starting to see everywhere, but here more than anywhere, is an increase in crustose coralline algae. So we're seeing uh, these uh, resilience indicators, mm -hmm. you know, crustose being very important to new larval recruitment. If you're looking at an oblique angle, you will see it looks pretty good, right? It looks all nice pastels. But if you look straight down into it, you're going to notice there's a lot of fragmentation. There's a lot of algae growing in between. There's a lot of partial mortality of the colonies. And it's really easy to look at all the light colored stuff. It grabs your eye. But I want you guys to look at the darker colored stuff, the, the browns and grays and the algae and the mortality. I want you to kind of grasp what we're dealing with. Coral is a living animal. It is a living animal. And it's a very, very amazing, resilient, incredible animal that we have been hammering to death. And they're just about to give up. <laughs> so, so, but seriously, I mean, they're so amazing that if we remove the stressors, we see time and time again that they have the ability to, to rebound, to grow and be healthy again. And when it comes to our coral reefs, resilience is the key, right? Managing for resilience. A healthy ecosystem, if it's whole in its system, all of its parts are there and working, it's in better health to deal with the global stressors that we're going to have to deal with. We have natural bioerodors. Our parrotfish are out there chomping on the algae and taking that, that calcium carbonate substrate and pooping it out and making sand. We've got a lot of calcium carbonate based limu or algae mm -hmm. that grow here that create sand. Cool. Um, it is very cool. When we go out, I'm going to take you on the outer side of the reef first. We'll take a look at one dead zone and get familiar with what that looks like. Then we're going to take a cruise just to see what this whole reef looks like, to see why we're fighting so hard for this reef, because there's a lot we're saving. And then I'll show you a second dead zone, which is in front of this first building on the outer portion of the reef. We call it the, um, the boneyard, because a lot of the skeletons are still standing. Um, but they're, they're mostly dead. But that area still gets recruitment, which is pretty amazing. And then we'll kind of uh, angle in towards the, uh, far cl the northern corner of the second building to see where uh, the, these seat prominent seeps are that the EPA has been sampling for the last couple of years, looking at the wastewater coming in. We might not be able to see much, but do look for the nitrogen bubbles coming out of the substrate. It's very indicative of, of the, uh, what's happening. Grab your snorkel to check out the effects of algae overgrowth and sewage seeping into the waters of Kahikili. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. Welcome back. Darla White from the Division of Aquatic Resources talks us through our snorkel of Kahekili. Can you kind of walk me through our snorkel and so what, what we saw in sort of each Point. Sure. <laughs> so, so where the dive flags are out in the water there is a, is a sand channel, really wide sand channel. And the dive flags are there because there's, uh, they call it the classroom. But oh. <laughs> just on the southern side of those dive flags is an, a dead zone uh, we call the sand channel. <laughs> and it is, um, it, it's just these areas where you have a lot of mortality. It's just kind of, it's crumbled. It looks like a grenade went off. In fact, in that particular one, we had that very large coral head that's fallen mm -hmm. over as well. Traversed the reef and got a good look at what's going on, what the reef looks like, how much we have we're saving, you know? I'm really, really trying to get folks to look at the coral colonies themselves and what's live and what's dead because we have a lot of fragmentation 
of the, the coral tissue uh, itself. So you'll have like a colony, but a lot of partial mortality, parts of it have died back. And, and that can actually impact the coral's ability to reproduce and grow. When we get over in front of this first building on the outer edge of the reef is an area we like to call the boneyard. And you're cruising along, you're seeing all the pretty pastels of live coral and all of a sudden it's dark and gray. And in this particular area, a lot of those uh, skeletons of the coral colonies are still standing upright. So if you were able to free dive down and look at it, it just looks kind of ghostly. And even the one coral colony that we had over there finally fell over. So that was, uh, that was the first time I've seen that, actually. So it's like, and you're down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, we um, head over towards uh, where they were sampling from the wastewater seat in front of the second building on the north corner. And along the way, I um, like to show folks areas of these dead zones, these areas that are really highly impacted with high mortality. When you start to come in more shallow, we have a lot larger uh, colonies, a lot of the lobe corals. And a lot of these colonies, some of them are really big and some of them are really resistant. They look pretty happy out there, but most of them don't. Most of them look like little patchworks, little quilts, or what I like to call them a pizza. And, you know, these are really, really, really slow growing colonies. They did not get that big in that condition, right? and now they're looking really sad. Unfortunately, today we had a lot of uh, really uh, high turbidity in the shallow area where that freshwater seep is, so it wasn't any good to, couldn't even find it. But if it had been clear, what would we have seen? So if it would have been clear, so just um, on that area where the reef stops and we have this like a, a cap rock kind of environment before the sand, uh, which is in about four to five feet of water, depending on the tide, um, uh, you see, uh, bubbles, air bubbles, nitrogen bubbles coming all the surface. You see blurry water. The fresh water is blurry because mm -hmm. it's a different density of the salt water. And um, this water is unusually warm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's 83 degrees night and day. <laughs> usually springs are in the 60s, right? Right, they're usually colder. Yeah, this one's not cold at all. <laughs> How come? Good question, <laughs> good question. Um, lots of people have thought maybe it's the bacterial um, activity that's heating it up. Don't really, there hasn't been anything definitive that I've heard of. The reef used to come up closer than it does now. And folks that have been coming here for more, you know, 25, 30 years will all tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. The reef used to come up almost to the shoreline. So it's, it's not now, it's back a bit. And everything in that transition zone between this this kind of pavement area and the reef looks pretty sad. It looks really degraded. Yeah, I was really surprised. I, cause on, as you're saying, on the way out, there were patches of healthy parts and then there were patches of sort of those boneyard areas. But on the way back in the shallower area, especially as we approached the sand channel, there was so much algae growing on top of the corals. Yeah, yeah it's good fish food. <laughs> If you have the herbivores. Yes, if you have the herbivores, exactly. <laughs> the herbivores are doing pretty good around the, the algae, but they've got lots of food. <laughs> when we were out there, there was a lot of dead coral. A lot of dead coral, yes. Uh -huh. And is that typical of what you would like to see? <laughs> <laughs> no. Reef that isn't growing is eroding, right? And, and so and you notice when you're out there, a lot of those areas we're calling little dead zones. They're, they're actually kind of concave. We're losing the complexity. When those areas over in these recent couple of years have been covered in the crustos, it's like, okay, there's hope. There's a lot of hope. Do you have any idea why, like as we were swimming, there would be an area where the coral seems to be doing pretty well and everything's kind of healthy. And then just right adjacent to that, right next door, you know, there's like Pryde's heads that had fallen over or a lot of algae on the coral. And so do you understand why it's so patchy like that? We do have some, some hypotheses that, that there's probably localized acidification in areas out there. The finger coral, the Pryde's compressa, is being affected most because it's high surface area to volume ratio and um, porous skeleton, mm -hmm. you would almost expect it's the more fragile and would be affected first. And that's the areas that are really crumbling. And we do have a significant freshwater source here with the West Lahaina Wastewater Reclamation Facility, just a quarter mile up the road. We know it's coming in on the reef here. We can measure it really uh, fairly easily in the nearshore area where there's not 
reef structure. It's a little bit harder to look out over the reef structure and tell what's going on. There's some, been some really great research here that's pointed to um, anthropogenic input. Like the wastewater treatment. Like the wastewater treatment. Um, Megan Daylor uh, used our native ulva to, to give us some stable nitrogen isotope signals and showed that it's, it's a um, wastewater or, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Metabolic waste, um, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, the highest, the highest M15 values in the literature. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, and some uh, in one spot by double. So, yeah. And and you know, uh, USGS Chip Hunt came out here and did a lot of uh, chemical work with the water and found everything from, um, you know, fabric brightener to pharmaceuticals to um, flame retardant. It's wastewater, you know, and, it, and it's not just about the nutrients in there. It's every other toxicant that anybody puts down their drain. I mean, from, from, from insecticides to paint to obviously fabric brightener to pharmaceuticals to, you know, there's all kinds of things in that water that aren't treated. Right, I've been to talks and heard about, you know, people are studying, well, how does your medicine affect fish or affect sharks or affect marine mammals? And I am super interested in that. Yeah, the, the um, uh, endocrine disruptors. Right. Right, and, and I would love to see some work done on that here. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had some great new research by Craig Glenn from UH Manoa on an EPA-funded project looking at the time of travel between the wastewater injection wells and the reef using a dye tracer study. And they've definitively shown that it is going from A to B, and the time of travel is about three months. So they actually put dye in and track it. Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they certainly did. <laughs> so, so what, I mean, there's all of the research that's been done here has pointed to that as a major stressor. The county's been working with the EPA on, on getting the wastewater disinfected. So they put in UV filters, and while they were constructing that, they did put bleach in the water to eliminate some of the health hazards to people. We've already seen some significant bleaching events these last couple of years. Our reefs need our help as much as possible now. We need to, we need to stop overfishing. We need to uh, reduce land-based sources of pollution. We need to remove the stressors from our reefs, period, and so that they have a better chance of buying them more time to deal, to be healthier and deal with the global stressors because acidification and warming oceans are coming. And why are reefs so important? They, I mean, in Hawaii, I can't, I mean, the depth and of the importance, I mean, from cultural to subsistence to recreation and just joy, but the biodiversity and itself, in and of itself, a quarter of all of our species are found nowhere else on the planet. It's an amazing ecosystem all in itself. It acts as a barrier to to waves and shoreline erosion. They're the cities for everything that lives out there. For people who want to get involved and make a difference, what can they do? There's many, many things that you can do to make a difference. Number one, reduce your CO2 emissions. <laughs> Number one, that matters. It really, really matters um, how much CO2 we're putting into our atmosphere. So um, your energy choices are really important. Your choices as a consumer are incredibly important. Use use earth and ocean friendly products. It matters what goes down your drain because here in the islands, it goes right there. And, <laughs> and third, just be Pono. If you fish, just take what you need, you know? Yeah. Got it, we have to malama this. We wanna keep it. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Foote. And I coordinate two complementary programs focused on this area in West Maui. One is the Makai Watch program, which focuses on what's in the ocean and, and promoting the effectiveness of the Kahakili Herbivore Fisheries Management Area. What I do is I help coordinate an effort to engage community members and individuals because we all can make a difference. So the first program I was gonna share with you folks about is the Makai Watch program. Has anyone heard of it? 
It's a, okay, good. <laughs> it's a statewide program. So it's sort of like neighborhood watch in the ocean where you have community groups who care about a particular area. It's in need of stewardship and support. Folks get trained as far as how to identify violations and report violations, working with DOCARE, working with Division of Aquatic Resources and Darla's group too, as far as the biological monitoring. There's citizen science, there's outreach and education. People do things to help management, they care about the area. We try to get the word out in various ways. We host public events, volunteer opportunities. People can come do beach cleanups, and we have a big annual event here called the Ridge Reef Rendezvous to really get people involved and aware. Um, we've had a fishing tournament, so all the different you know, stakeholder type uh, folks can get engaged and try to help spread the message about what this area is, how it's unique, why it's important, and why everyone should kind of help play a role to take care of it. It's, it's daunting all that we need to do in the watershed from Malchus and Mackay to kind of help bring our ecosystems back. But there are things people can do and we need to be optimistic and collectively we can make a difference if we take these steps and get involved. And in addition to that personal level to contribute, it's also about getting involved in the bigger decisions. So engaging with your council people, asking for more progressive planning, enforcement of construction practices and other things. So it's beyond just what we're doing, it's what we're doing as a community. If we don't start doing something pretty quickly, we're not gonna have what we love left. And so time is of essence. I just got out of the water and I can't say in like eight years since I first snorkeled here with you, um, it's changed dramatically. Okay. And the coral, there's so much less coral and so much more algae. It happens gradually, and if you lose sight of what things used to be, it's easy to just be complacent, but to realize things have changed over time, and we really need to take steps to protect it now before we forget what good used to be. Can I say the other neat thing she did? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing that, that I've seen happen, and it, partly it's been thanks to Liz having really deep roots in this area, is it used to sort of feel like there were the water people and there were the mountain people. And it's been really neat to see that bridge build. And the people who volunteer in the water are now volunteering in the mountain, and the people in the mountain are more interested in what's happening. And so, I don't know, it seems like a new thing that people are actually honestly thinking in the way we kind of need to if we're gonna be addressing these problems. If your projects are successful, what do you hope to see? And then on the flip side is, in worst case scenario, what could it look like? Well, best case, <laughs> herbivores grazing the reef and keeping the turf algae at bay and the crustose coralline algae is continuing to grow and create that perfect substrate for all the larvae to come and land from all the other reefs that are seeding it that are also healthy. <laughs> and we have you know, more fish and more diversity and resilience and we have some changes made to the injection well so that uh, disposal onto the reef is no longer uh, the current practice. If we don't get our act together, both Malka, you know, up watershed and Mackay, our fishing practices, our land use practices, we'll continue to see degradation. Like this reef has shown signs of res resilience, which is great, but it's still threatened. It's still here where it, it should be here. <laughs> and that's what we're aiming for. So it's, it could easily continue on a path where if we don't do proactive measures and, and all together holistically, we could lose the reef. We've seen so much of it degrade already. I've lived here 20 years and it's been really sad and alarming and the sense of urgency should not be you know, understated that we, we really need to take care of our reefs, this one, everyone in the state. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group, teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.